guys, it's Sandro here, and welcome to part 2 of the detail on this 2020 Camaro ZL1. I hope you guys have seen part 1, as I'm going to jump straight into part 2 by doing a test section on the paint to see what pad, compound and technique is going to work best to restore this badly damaged paint. I'm using the ShineMate Cordless 21mm polisher with the new Ripes Yellow Foam Pad and their fine DA compound as a starting point. I'm going to start with just a few drops of product on the pad, speed forward my polisher and work an area about 6 times the size of my pad with a moderate arm speed and just light pressure doing 3 to 4 row passes. Once I'm done I'll use compressed air to blow out my pad, wipe the compound off the panel and then use an IPA panel wipe to remove any polishing oils and also remove the masking tape before inspecting the finish all of which is done so I can get the clearest and best information possible when assessing each test section. Now as we have a look at the results, I must say that I'm surprised that this very fine polish and quite gentle polishing pad have been able to remove at least 50% of the defects quite easily. Now the more moderate to deeper isolated scratches haven't been removed, and although the finish is quite good, I can still see a little haze. So at first glance, it would appear that this is potentially quite a soft paint, meaning that the defects shouldn't be too difficult to remove, but finishing well may be the real challenge ahead. For a second test section, I stuck with the exact same combination of polish and pad, but this time just adjusted my technique with a slightly higher machine speed, slower arm movement and a touch more pressure. So I basically adjusted my technique to maximize this combination's cutting ability. What I've also found is that these new Ribes foam pads seem to have a break-in period, and the pads themselves actually shed a tiny layer of foam particles the first time you use them, which is kind of strange and the first time I've seen this with any foam pad. In any case, they should work better after breaking them in and then blowing or brushing them out. Now as we have a look at the results in this second test section, it's actually still pretty close to the results in the first prior section. I have managed to get a little more cut and defect removal without really compromising the finish which almost looks identical, but in any case those deeper remaining scratches will need a more aggressive combination in order to remove them. For a third test section I stuck to the same Rupes Fine DA compound but this time used it with the Ripper's medium wall pad and my method and technique was identical to the last section.
Now, as far as defect removal goes, this time I'd say I was able to remove not only the lighter swells, but also the more moderate ones, maybe getting about 80% total defect removal in this section. However, the random, isolated, deeper scratches, or rids, did still remain, and hopefully you guys can also see quite a bit of haze and micro-marring that this combination has created. Now, I've used this same pad to finish almost perfectly on even some softer paints. So at this stage, I think it's safe to say that I'm dealing with quite a soft and extremely sensitive paint. But because the paint is so bad, it means that I still need more cut to remove those deeper scratches and defects in place. For a fourth test section, I went back to the Ripper's yellow foam pad, but this time stepped up to a medium compound in the form of Shell Concepts S20 Black. Now I know that this foam pad is finishing reasonably well, so my goal here would be to retain the good finish that this pad is producing, but increase its cutting ability. Now this section actually had the best balance of cut and finish of all the tests so far, and if I was doing a quicker one step polish, it could actually be a great option. But since I'm looking for a higher end result for my client, it still falls short, maybe achieving 75% or so defect removal, and I can also see some slight haze in the finish, which could definitely be better. For a fifth test section, I stuck with Shoal S20, but this time used it with the Ripper's new blue foam cutting pad. Now, my initial goal when approaching paint correction is to always try and find a single stage combination that can both cut and finish perfectly, as it's not only a far more efficient way of approaching paint correction, but it's also less aggressive. But at this stage, I think it's safe to say that it's going to be near impossible to single stage this paint to a higher result, as the defects are just too severe and the paint is just too sensitive to achieve that. So now my focus changes to discovering the least aggressive combination of pad, compound and technique that's going to remove at least 95% of the existing defects while still retaining as much clear coat as possible. Now looking at the results, I'd say that this section has the best defect removal so far, maybe around the 85% mark or so. And although the finish isn't terrible, there was obviously quite a bit more haze here compared to using the previous yellow finishing foam pad. For a sixth test section, it was time to get a little more serious and step up to a heavy cutting compound in the form of Shell Concepts S2 Black on the Lake Country Blue HDO foam pad. And once again, I'm still using the same basic technique just maybe doing an extra pass or two to ensure that the compound fully breaks down. Now once you guys have a look at the results, you'll hopefully see that I managed to crack at least 90% defect removal, and you'll also see that the finish was actually better than the last section. The reason I keep coming back to the Lake Country Blue HDO foam pads is that they just finish so well for a cutting pad while still providing a good amount of cut. And I'll also say that I've just fallen in love with Shell Concepts S2 Black as it just cuts so well and still finishes amazingly for a heavy cut compound. Now as great as the last section was, it still fell short of my 95% plus defect removal goal. Now for some reason, this paint just didn't seem to like the Ripper's medium yellow wall pad when I previously tried it. So I decided to try their blue coarse wall pad instead with Shell S2 Black to see if it would give me that extra leveling ability that I was looking for. Now once you guys have a look at the results, you'll hopefully see that this combination finally got me to that 95% plus defect removal rate. And although there was certainly some compounding haze in the finish, it really wasn't that bad and hopefully won't be too difficult to remove in a second finishing stage. Now the centre bonnet panel, as well as the lower skirts of this car, are painted in a metallic black. So my next step was to see if this cutting combination would also work well on that diverse paint. After doing a quick test section, I found that this was by far a much, much nicer paint to work on. The defects seemed to level down easier, the finish came out better, and the compound itself was just easier to wipe off this paint. 
So by comparison, this was actually quite an easygoing, non-fussy paint to work with, and my combination here worked even better. So with all of that sorted out, I proceeded to correct that area of the bonnet, starting with my smaller 2 and 3 inch polishes and pads to do all the edge work, followed by my larger 6 inch polisher for the flat work. Smaller polishes and pads allow you to get right into those tight sharp areas and achieve a higher level of correction. Additionally, they're also far less aggressive than larger polishes and pads, so around more delicate and sensitive body lines and edges, they're also far less risky and help preserve more clear coat in those areas compared to running a larger pad which is far more aggressive and less effective in those intricate areas. But when it comes to the larger, flatter panel areas, a full size polisher and pad is always going to be the best option for a fast and efficient workflow. The next step was figuring out which polish and pad would work best to refine the compounding haze and restore maximum gloss and clarity to this paint. Now during my prior testing I noticed that I was still getting a little haze in the finish even when using a fine polish and pad. In my experience larger 21mm throw DA polishes are fantastic for cutting and even finishing on hard to medium paints but they just don't tend to finish as well on softer or more sensitive paints. So to try and achieve the best possible finish, I switched to my 12mm throw 5 inch dual action polisher, which won't tend to cut quite as much as a larger throw DA, but tends to finish extremely well. I used the same Ripper's yellow foam pad with their DA fine compound, but this time limited the amount of compound on my pad set my machine speed to about 4.5 and, and used a moderate arm speed with moderate pressure. I know this part of refining the paint is harder to clearly see on camera, but I'll do my best to explain what I was seeing in person. So this combination definitely worked better this time round with my smaller 12mm throw DA polisher, and for all intensive purposes it was still a pretty decent finish. But if I was being picky, I would say that I could still see a little micro hazing in the finish, meaning that it could still be better. Now, for a direct comparison, I switched to the Ripper's yellow white foam pad and their Uno Pure Super Fine Polish using the very same technique as the previous section. Once we have a look at the results, hopefully, you guys will see that it was a slight step down in clarity and actually produced a little more haze in its finish than the previous section. Super fine pads and polishes are just one of those things that can work extremely well at times, but ultimately the paint is going to decide what it likes best, and in this case it just wasn't a great finishing combination for this particular paint. The next combination I decided to try was the Lake Country Orange HDO Foam Pad and NV Finesse Polish. This is actually my most widely used finishing combination, so I know it usually finishes perfectly on most paints. Now out of the last three sections, this was actually the best one so far, with very minimal haze that was almost impossible to detect. But once again, if I was being fussy, I could see just a hint of micro hazing in the finish that meant the finish could still be better. For a fourth finishing test section I stuck with NV Finesse Polish, but this time used it with the Shymate Red Foam Finishing Pad. I understand that it may be hard to clearly see the results on camera, but the finish here was just about perfect with fantastic levels of gloss, saturation and clarity that really made it the winning finishing step 
combination. So with finally working out both my cutting and finishing combinations, I set out to complete the whole bonnet in this two stage process. Nothing is ever perfect when it comes to paint correction, and this paint was definitely no easy task to correct. But hopefully you guys will see just what a dramatic difference and improvement was achieved on the bonnet, after spending the best part of a day testing and discovering what this paint needs, likes and responds best to.
As I'm correcting the paint on the roof, I just want to highlight a few things about this paint and job. If it didn't come across earlier, just let me reaffirm that this was one difficult paint to correct, or at least to a high-end level. But beyond that, its sensitivity is just awful and well beyond the realm of being acceptable from a car manufacturer. Additionally, the swirls, scratches and etchings are quite significant and deep, meaning that it's still a lot of work to remove them, and equally, if not much more work to refine the paint to a high gloss and clarity finish. It's sometimes hard to depict frustration and the obstacles that a certain car and its paint can present in a video, but this was easily one of the most challenging and testing paints I've ever worked on over the last 25 years. To put it simply, this is just a horrible paint any which way you look at it, and apart from the difficulty of correcting it, it's also going to be a nightmare to maintain it in the future. I work on soft and sensitive paints all the time, and I personally own a black car with soft paint, but this paint is just on another level, and easily makes my top 10 worst paints I've ever come across to correct, as its sensitivity is just ridiculous, and I don't understand why that in 2020, car manufacturers are using such horrible paints when there's so many fantastic paints to choose from. Well, maybe I do understand, and it comes down to using the cheapest and nastiest paint to keep costs down. I just think it's such a shame because this car is just awesome in so many ways, but unless someone really knows what they're doing, they're just going to hack this paint if they try polishing it, and the owner is just going to have to be extra cautious in washing and maintaining it in the future. Yes, a ceramic coating will help make it a touch more swirl resistant, but nothing's going to significantly change the way this paint behaves unless the owner forks out another big chunk of money to cover it in paint protection film. Another thing that's important to note about this ZL1 is that it's just got so many sharp body lines, dramatic curves and intricate panels and trims that really makes it just as difficult as any exotic or supercar to correct. I think I spent over an hour on just those tail lights for instance that look great but are just so crazy in design which makes them extra time consuming to correct. So I just found myself constantly having to use my 1 inch rotary polisher in so many areas as nothing else would fit 
and even having to do quite a bit of hand polishing in certain areas, all of which just makes it quite a time consuming car to work on. I really hope this video isn't coming across as me just complaining about this car because it's really not what I'm about. I accept that some cars are always going to be more challenging and time consuming than others and I'm completely fine with that and even try to take it on as a challenge. In fact it's cars like these that constantly teach me so much about my trade as if you can nail a job like this you just come out the other end stronger and wiser for it. All I'm trying to do is be real in communicating how this car and paint was like to work with which was uncommonly bad, tough and trying. Now my goal with high end paint correction is always to get to that 95% defect removal stage as long as it's safe to do so and it's not going to compromise the paint in the future. Additionally and just as importantly I'm always looking to achieve the best gloss and clarity levels possible which in a nutshell is what high end paint correction is all about. But something that was at the forefront of this job in particular for me was that the owner of this Camaro bought a brand new or demo car but was given a scratched, etched and swirled up mess of a car instead. So I also wanted him to have a proper new car paint experience and be able to enjoy it the way he should have from the start and it was really important to me to produce something at the end of all of this that gives him that experience. In part 1 of this series I mentioned that I just couldn't understand how a new car's paint could look so bad with so many severe defects in such a short amount of time. But by the end of correcting this paint I was able to understand it. In my opinion 50% of the blame rests with the car dealership as I don't care how soft or sensitive a paint is, there's no excuse for hacking the paint to bits by using terrible car washing and cleaning methods. And there's also no excuse for presenting a car in such a bad state to a buyer even if it was a demo car. But it was only after correcting this paint that I truly understood and appreciated just how soft and sensitive it really was. I mean this paint will scratch if you sneeze close to it and the blame for that has to rest with the car manufacturer for choosing such a horribly soft and ridiculously sensitive paint to put on this car. Now in part 1 you guys also saw that the paint was suspiciously thick, averaging 300 microns and beyond, which definitely isn't common and almost points to this paint being scuffed up and painted over cheaply as a respray. But the paint was also very consistent with an OEM finish, so I didn't see any evidence that it had been resprayed, but if it did it also means that whoever did it had to remove all the doors, bonnet, boot and all the trims as those door jams and all the areas around the plastic trims were finished to an OEM spec. So I don't know what to tell you guys other than this is original OEM paint or someone meaning the manufacturer or dealership went to a lot of trouble and expense to repaint this car for some unknown reason to make it look like an OEM finish which is horrible to think that they would do that and brings up the question why. In any case I can't be certain either way but I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt. I think I've done more than enough talking in this video so I'll leave you guys with the rest of the footage and hope you stay tuned for part 3 and the final chapter of this series where I'll be ceramic coating the paint, 
giving you my final summary on this job and showing you guys the final finished results. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please share this video, like, comment and subscribe to this channel to show your support for this content and I'll see you guys soon. Picture perfect on the surface All these illusions that we worship I see the walls, see the walls coming down I hope someday we'll build them up on solid ground Consequences go unnoticed Like the weight that's on our shoulders Pulling us down, pulling us down But we don't know it Or maybe we do just like the truth we never show it We don't need no money Cause money ain't the problem, baby What are we becoming? Cause we lost more time than we'll ever get back And we need something to keep us on track